<laughs> do a good job cooking. <laughs> she was once the picture of light, love, and laughter. <laughs> But after a tragic car crash took the life of her closest friend, Rachel Burkheimer turned to the comfort of dangerous drugs and an equally dangerous and jealous boyfriend, John Diggy Anderson, one of the leaders of a small-time gang called the Northwest Mafia. This is not a guy you want to date. This is not a guy you want to mess with. He really didn't have a conscience. He always had guns with him. He was very violent. Rachel's family was thrilled when she finally decided to cut ties with Anderson. In fact, Rachel bonded in friendship with another gang member, Maurice Rivas. The two vowed to leave the gang life behind, go back to school, get jobs, and take care of each other. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I've never met this young man. I'm glad he's inspired her. This is a friendship I really would like to, to nourish. But Rachel's goals for a new beginning were much easier said than done. Hard as she tried, Rachel seemed obsessed with Anderson. She rekindled an on-again, off-again romance with the petty criminal. I thought, you know, this is just a phase. Uh, a lot of teenagers go through this. She'll get out of it. But she didn't. In fact, Rachel jumped back in the fire with both feet. During an off period with Anderson, she dated one of his best friends. Rachel naively saw no harm in her actions. She was a party girl. She wanted to have fun. She wanted everybody around her to have fun. Anderson wasn't laughing. And adding fuel to his ire, perhaps in a drug-induced state of paranoia, say police, Anderson and his cohorts become convinced Rachel was passing gang secrets to her friends, including some rivals of Anderson's. Rachel was now in danger. There is information in the case that Rachel had been warned that there was a hit on her. Rachel was scared and went to her older sister, Megan, for advice. What do you do as a sister in that regard? I told her, OK, look, you need to be aware. You need to be cautious. Stay away from him, for sure. But I just thought, he's some dumb young punk. Dumb young punk, perhaps, but a murderer? When she left my room that night, I'll never forget, she closed the door, and for a split second, something went off in my head, and it just said, but what if? And I thought, no. On a crisp September evening, Rachel attended a party at this Everett duplex with seven members of the Northwest Mafia. She felt safe in the company of her friend Maurice Rivas, who had not yet pried himself away from the gang either. I know. Rachel wanted to prove to her pals she had not betrayed them. And that was Rachel. She thought she was in control. I'm sure she thought she could talk her way through this situation. And so it begins with a good time. Rachel, as usual, orchestrating the fun and laughs. They were all sitting around the couch having a fun, tickling, giggling. They were smoking a little bit of marijuana. John Anderson has just arrived and doesn't like what he sees. He's angry because everybody's having such a good time. He smacks a couple of the kids in the face. The confrontation escalates and guns are drawn. Rachel got scared and tried to leave. Rachel would never make it to the door. She had unwittingly fallen into a calculated trap set by John Anderson and his crew. And the horror has only just begun. He grabs her by the hair, hits her in the face, knocks her down on the floor. A couple of the other guys start helping. Rachel is kicked in the head repeatedly. Someone orders the stereo be turned up to drown out her screams. They scooped up Rachel, took her out to the garage, gagged her and taped her so she couldn't scream anymore. Rachel is left in the garage while her attackers discuss what to do next. They talk about a gang rape. They talk about ransom. There was discussions about whether or not they could get her dad to pay money to get her back. The hapless team of wannabe crime bosses couldn't make up their minds. Instead, they ate pizza played video games and got high while Rachel lay on the garage floor in terror. Suddenly, there's a glimmer of hope for Rachel when the owner of the home, Trissa Connor, shows up. She's the girlfriend of one of the gang leaders. Trissa walked into the garage, saw Rachel beat up and tied up. 
she went back to the kitchen to get a knife to try and cut her hands and feet loose. But Anderson, in a rage, stops Trissa from freeing Rachel. Trissa just started screaming at everybody that she was going to call the cops and to get Rachel out of her garage. Trissa never calls police, but the flustered gangsters stuff Rachel's tiny 411 frame in a duffel bag and into the back of this Jeep. I know at one point they claimed that they talked about getting a hotel room and letting her heal up and letting her go. So much for mercy. Four of them, including John Anderson and Rachel's good friend, Maurice Rivas, the friend who had once vowed to protect her, drive 30 miles into the mountains. As the version went, they decided that it was John Anderson's mess and, and he was going to have to deal with it. Rachel's fate had been sealed. The plan was to kill her. Anderson and two others leave to go get shovels and other supplies. Stunningly, Maurice is ordered to stay behind and keep watch over Rachel, who is now a hostage destined for death. Coming up. Maurice unzips the duffel bag. Alone with Rachel, it was Maurice Rebus's chance to change her daunting fate. She told him that she knew that she was going to die. Would Maurice Rebus make good on his promise to protect his friend? Would Maurice be valiant or villainous? I know she's thinking, somebody's going to save me. 